I'll tell you what's about the blues is so magical. It's more than just the focus, the intensity, the charisma that comes across sometimes in a song on the, on the part of a performer. It's way more than that. When I'm singing the blues, or when I hear the blues being sung, somewhere in me is the awareness of those men in particular out in the fields working. I'm talking about the labor they did, the ax chopping, and the hammering spikes, uh, you know, with, with a uh, sledgehammer on the railroad, and lying in track. I'm aware somehow of those long lines of men sweating and toiling during the day. So that hypnotic quality that the blues has was something that they used in the field, the repetition of those verses and the rhythm, the endlessly repeating rhythm, so that they could get their bodies moving. And I feel like those men are standing with me. When I'm singing the blues, I get past the whole thing about do I deserve to sing the blues or not because my skin is this color, and, but I didn't pick cotton. And, you know, no. I claim it. I claim it as a descendant, as an acolyte, as a worshiper, as an admirer in the blood. It's those men and women, but men in particular, who labored in the hot sun. Now, does it, do you ever find it troubling that sometimes younger black people aren't necessarily gravitating to, to blue shirts? I find it troubling. Yes, I would like to see more black people in audiences. <clears throat> but understand, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I'd be lucky if one small part of 1% of my audience was black. I would be out performing in the wilds and there'd be an auditorium filled with white people and maybe one black face come in the door and in the back of the auditorium and I'd look and suddenly there'd be like this little secret I'm sharing with somebody. It wouldn't mean that I'd give any less of myself to the show if no black people were there. I'd give them everything, my whole heart, everything. But when I see a black person come in, there is something personal. There is something about the blues because it was created by black people for black people to be sung to black people. Nowadays, you're going to find very little of that. You're going to find mostly Caucasian bands playing to mostly Caucasian audiences. And I guess that has to be what it is. But I stand for the time when blues had race, had, it came from something. It came from uh, people crying out for some humanity here, man. And I can't dictate what others should sing about or whether they should sing at all. But it is important for me to say once upon a time there were a people who invented the blues. And uh, so that is my job is to tell that story and sing those songs, as well as my own that helped me tell the story. Yeah, I guess I'd have to say the very earliest time it bit me was being performed by white college boys in some informal setting and I was uh, you know, less than probably eight years or less, eight years old or less, and I can't remember where I was, but they were singing something that sounded like Howlin' Wolf or something like that, and I remember it sounded special, like nothing else that I'd ever heard. I couldn't say that I knew it was from black people. That awareness came about later, but I knew the music was special. Do you feel a connectedness to it you know, in terms of I feel a uh, tremendous connectedness to it, uh, not just in terms of straight blues, because I didn't hear that growing up in my household. Yet my grandmother, who outlived my grandfather by a great deal, this is my father's mother, was what I call blues people. She grew up during the times of terror. She was born in 1898, uh, had a fifth grade education, and uh, she was a church going woman. So there was an absence of blues in her household, yet the blues is made up of such people. It's made up of the folks who had struggled to make communities work in spite of terrorists wearing uh, white sheets um, saying that they couldn't. The times of the, I call them the black codes, ever since after Reconstruction, when they'd make sure that the prisons were filled with black people to continue with the labor that they lost when slavery was ended, you know. Uh, 
that is what the blues came up out of, and that is what my grandmother came from. So yeah, the blues consciously was absent, but it was all around me. Now, I mean, I mean, uh, again, just to reiterate, you've made this your life. Uh, in terms, I mean, because a lot of people know you from Beat Street. Yeah. You know, but but that's that was that doesn't always come up in interviews. Oh, it comes up rarely. Once in a while it comes up in an interview, uh, the movie Beat Street. And heck, if I got offered a movie and pay me some money, I'm, I'm do it in a flash. But um, this music is truly my passion, but also storytelling. And that's the part that makes me an actor regardless of, uh, of the music. Not so much regardless of the music, but in conjunction with the music. I am an actor. Uh, Beat Street was a golden opportunity it eventually led me down the road to doing One Life to Live. But um, like I said, it was a golden opportunity. But I belong telling stories. I belong being in front of people, letting them know a little bit of the history and the joy that the music brings. You know? Sometimes I feel like blowing our walls from home. Oh, this morning, everything I had was gone. Oh, that's strictly selfish on my part doing those children's shows, man, because they're going to be my audience in 20 years. I intend to still be working. I'm going to be that little old wrinkly old dude playing the guitar up on the side of the stage. I want them to come see me. I want them to remember like I did when I was maybe eight years old, down in the front of the auditorium with these big eyes, looking up at somebody with a guitar. To me, that was magic, man. That was pure magic that you could take this chunk of wood with strings on it and make music. I remember sitting down in my aunt's lap. She had a guitar. She had just played it. And um, she sat me down in her lap and put the guitar on my lap. And I remember I put my whole fist down through the hole to try to pull the music out. She said, no, 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 just stroke it real, just stroke it real gently like that and the music comes. I thought it was something you could just pull out of there, man. Uh, and it is magic. It is magic to take a thing and make it come alive. <laughs> On a New York City street with a smoking fucking beat. They used to hang out all night and just gang fight, leaving bodies all over the street. But now it's hip hop, break dance, pop, electric boogie just won't stop. Everything in the town is built around that cutting, the scratching, the hip hop sound. On Beat Street. Beat Street! Kenny is a DJ, known as Double K, and he says he's gonna make it someday on Beat Street. Beat Street came out in 1984. The album that I put out came out in 1978, and it was a folk album, not a blues album. Folk music was what I kind of cut my teeth on in the early years, starting age eight, got me playing the banjo, that sort of thing. And I heard some early, early examples of the blues, but the folk music, the singing together with a room full of people was uh, my first real exposure to music, my first full exposure to music, other than listening to records like Alvin and the Chipmunks or whatever. Uh, so <clears throat> when Beat Street came along, I was in the process of really discovering myself as a musician, as a guitarist, including folk, including the blues, uh, yeah, I was very interested in the blues. I think before blues, I opened up a little more to ragtime. Ragtime was not so deep and heavy in certain ways. It was very beautiful and complex, and you, I could even hide behind it. The blues was kind of naked. Robert Johnson would sit there and say more with one note than I could with ten notes. And there are times his voice would just sit there, and the guitar would be under it. And I never had that kind of confidence where I could uh, have my voice be so featured and have the guitar in back of me. I was going to put the guitar out in front of me and, and show you, look how fancy I'm picking here, man. Got that thumb rocking and rolling. Look at those fingers. Um, but I had to learn. I had to learn technically about the music and I had to learn about Guy Davis. And I had to learn about my own validity being on this earth just because I'm breathing. And I had to learn that confidence is everything and confidence will come with the repetition of a thing and the doing of a thing and the repeating of a thing and the working of a thing. 
And that's what I tell my students, my music students. You got to keep working it. And then you got to decide that this song belongs to you now. You know, I'm singing Little Red Rooster. I'm, my aim is to sing it like it belongs to me. No, I didn't write it. It was written by Willie Dixon. Howlin' Wolf did the version that nobody will ever surpass. Yet the song is beautiful. And when I'm performing live, I'm going to do that song. I hope somebody will listen to it and say, hey, let me uh, find the, the roots of that song and then go listen to Howlin' Wolf doing it. Uh, yeah, I got to self-validate. The blues is a funny thing. It's not really a written art form. A lot's being written about it now, but it was mouth to ear. It was guitar, harmonica to ear. That's how the learning was done. So were you ever into hip hop? No, not really. Other than that movie, other than doing Beat Street, that's what brought me into hip hop as a curiosity, as an actor. And I can say, yeah, I learned how to scratch. I learned how to cut and mix and how to actually fade this speaker down and put that one up. And so technically I could do it, not well, but I could actually do it. They showed me how to do it. But hip hop has not been my uh, game, my strong suit or even my weak suit, not really. Um, I think I work better as a listener, as a philosopher. I could say hip hop is the grandchild of blues music. Uh, this, this rap, it is the grandchild, my God. When you hear uh, the blues man singing about the sheriff, the police, the, uh, the illegal hooch that they're drinking and making, the problems with the women going to jail. In hip hop, you're gonna hear similar things that have to do, maybe a little more drug oriented than uh, liquor oriented, unless it's, you know, uh, Hennessy or something like that. Um, they're still talking about how hot, hot and cool you are with the women. Uh, and then problems with the, the police. I was doing 55 and the 54, that kind of thing, you know. So, so you'll hear all those themes repeated. The blues 100 years ago was the devil's music. Now it's just this ancient museum stuff. And uh, hip hop is the devil's music. And in 100 years, if we're still lucky enough to still exist, I mean, if this planet's still here, something else will be the devil's music, you know. On the horizon for me, it's something that's already uh, been begun. Many years ago, I wrote a play called The Adventures of Fishy Waters in Bed with the Blues. Maybe I was a little young to be performing it, but it just recently had a run in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and it taught me a lot. It taught me that the basic writing was good, it needed some tweaking, it needed some working, and the experience of my years has helped me in that respect. It taught me to open up and trust a director with my work. That is a difficult process for me, that kind of trust, because I'm very intimate with my work. Uh, this play, I expect to see some more life, because it is a formal setting in which I get to tell stories of hobos, black folks, blues, <laughs> the whole spectrum, man. Uh, stuff that is racial, stuff that is serious, stuff dealing with lynchings, and otherwise stuff the tall tales and silly stories. You know, the, the whole spectrum of things. I'm going to continue doing that. I will continue doing concerts as I've done. I would like to work more with young people, including my son, in uh, this genre mixing. I like some of what I've heard, the sampling of blues masters uh, being used in modern work in, you know, with electric guitars and super rhythm tracks and things like that. People like R.L. Burnside. I like that, and I don't know why I like it, because I've, I've never been a purist, so that's not a problem with me. I mean, I love the blues, I love the pure blues, I love the hybrid blues, the rhythm and blues, or whatever you got. I love it. And I do believe, yes, that there's got to always be a clear line to the blues, but I think that mixing it with other genres maybe opens it up for people, people's curiosity to say, hey, what is that music in the background? I dig that. And do like I did many years ago, which is to see a movie like Lead Belly by Gordon Parks and then go search into Lead Belly, find out where his life differed from the movie and it differed substantially. But my curiosity was touched. That was the point of the movie. The point of the movie was to make me say, man, who's this lead belly cat? So that's what I want to do with the blues. That's what I want to do 
with uh, my life is to open up that curiosity chamber. And uh, I'll keep going with the pure blues as well as the mixed blues. But uh, to have people look up on the stage at me the way I looked up on the stage when I was small and see that magic, that's what I want. That's what I'm after. My name is Guy Davis, and you are watching Real Black. I mean real, real black. Oh my, the role of the griot, uh, that uh, the griot is a storyteller uh, from Africa, you know. I'm thinking of a, of a famous ending that I read in the African folk tales. This my story, if it be sweet or if it not be sweet, take some elsewhere and let some come back to me. Never chase women. And that was the whole of his advice from A to Z. Not another word, no more, no less. Never chase women. I had to extrapolate all of what that meant from those three words. And it ain't made my life no easier. <laughs>